the veterans for peace we are hold on here <laughs> speak right up to the microphone we are uh yeah a multinational organization that exposed the true cost of war human and environmental uh, our dear defense secretary general maddox mad dog uh, maddox uh, had a brilliant epiphany that Global warming and climate change is a uh, national security, uh, yeah, yeah. national security threat. Well, it is a global security threat, and uh, it's time that we assess the impact of uh, militarization and wars going back to Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the list would spread from here to the building across the street and the damage done. I would like General Maddox or uh, Secretary Maddox to talk to his commander, you know, the draft dodger in chief, Donald Trump, <laughs> what I knew I'm going to do was so heavily into denying the reality that we are all here for, Thank please, you, please talk to this man because he doesn't have a clue. I have seen, yes, I have seen in my military career the damage that warfare does, I have stood up to it at the risk of losing the status, the military status that I was in. It is time that we all take that little bit of change in our lives, the risk it takes. Rather, we can all be at a rally, we can all be uh, feeling good here today, but we need to, I did, believe me, it is a step I took. It felt bad at the time, but it feels good today to see that this really happened. I, as a pilot in the Air Force, did damage, and I stood up to it. I would like to really, when I came back, or when I went in the 60s, there was a sign which all the people will recognize, but the younger people won't. And I'll end by saying this, war is not healthy for children and other living things. Thank you. I just have to get a myself oriented and I love that sign over there that says the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe it or not Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson now probably he and I don't see eye to eye on things because I believe in a power greater than myself whereas he believes in something more mystical but anyway as it is said and that's a good thing that is not a put down that is also another way of seeing the world so what I want to say is that I uh, bring greetings from my church, and I'm having a little bit of problem with my phone, but here we go. Anyway, I've been asked to share a faith-based reaction to climate change. Now, some of you think, like, what does church have to do with climate change? Well, we stand with whatever is going on in the world. We are in the public square. We are literally today in the public square. And so I've been asked to share my perspective. And I know that my perspective may be different from some other conservative theological persons. So I'm not here to support them necessarily, but to say that there is a way that faith can be a part of the experience. So I have studied earth science, and I know that earth science is a good thing. And I know that if you put particulates into the air, if you increase carbon dioxide, you get this thing called the greenhouse effect. And that raises temperature. If you've ever been in a greenhouse, you know how warm it can get, even on a day as cloudy as it is now. 
in my faith tradition, the Episcopal Church, we talk about the environment. We even have a prayer for our communion service that we fondly call the Star Wars prayer, and this is what it says. As soon as I can get my phone to stop acting up. Yes. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us rulers of creation. Remember that. But we turned against you and creation and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. And this communion prayer speaks about stewardship at the base, basic level. Stewardship is simply remembering that this does not belong to you. This belongs to generations yet to come. We are, we are merely caretakers for the next generation. And so if we squander, continue to squander what we have right now, there will be nothing left. And I saw a sign that says, I'm marching for my grandchild. And that's why we're here today. And thankfully, thankfully there is a global shift in our thinking. There is a global shift in the theology or the God talk about creation and our caring for it. And for example, I'm going to read this. There is a theological shift in the thinking of the church on the matters of climate change. We are present to a profound conceptual shift that will move us far beyond stewardship theology as a response to human exploitation of God's creation. We are moving in that direction. We only have to look at how we have exploited poorer, co poorer countries, how we have exploited poor communities in the United States. When I grew, was living in New York City in the 80s, bus trips used to come up to Harlem and around St. John the Divine. The buses would idle in the hot summer, spewing lots of emissions, causing people who lived in that neighborhood who suffered from asthma to have higher um, attacks. And those people got together and said, this is not fair. And they got together and they said there will be no more idling of buses, and not only in Harlem, but in the city of New York. Yeah. I will also add, too, which goes without um, any further explanation, remember two words, Flint, Michigan. Yeah. And so that's what my faith calls me to do. My faith calls me to be here to be with you, to stand with you and know that you are not alone and that we are working from our end, from the faith-based end, to help our world continue. And I want to end this lastly. Remember, we gathered here to be a sign of God's hope. We must be persistent Now that's a brother that could do a little bit to help be a part. He doesn't know it yet. He hasn't got the change yet. But what I want to tell you is that we must be persistent in our hope. We must grow hope. Yeah. We together can choose whether we are destroying our environment and ourselves or if we are going to awake awaken to the fact that we are all interdependent. We all are in this together. And if we don't do something together, we will surely wind up in a place that we don't want to be. In my faith tradition, we say amen or amen. Amen, amen. simply means so be it. So we are here today to end climate change. Amen. amen. And now, we're honored to present the Reverend Canon Johnny Ross. Johnny's an Episcopal priest, a retired environmental scientist from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, a member of the Society of Ordained Scientists, 
and assistant to the Episcopal Bishop of Rochester. Come on up, Johnny. Thank you very much. I did not, I haven't played basketball since I was in high school, so, and uh, apparently it shows. Greetings from uh, the, the Episcopal Bishop of Rochester, the, Rep, the Right Reverend Prince G. Singh. First of all, I want to tell you that uh, uh, our bishop has this, uh, a saying that he says a lot, that uh, a person with a hammer, everything's a nail. <laughs> and so, a priest with a science degree, Everything is about science, right? And science teaches people of faith two very important lessons. The first is that all life, all life is genetically related. That means that every living thing on the planet, everything from bacteria to protists to fungi to plants and animals, share the information that we find encoded in our 23 pairs of chromosomes. Whether our co whatever our common ancestor was, it was a life form that not only was able to carry a little bit of our own genetic material, but it was extremely efficient in copying and pasting that material throughout the various ecosystems of our planet. The second thing that science teaches people of faith is that all living creatures are bound together in countless ecological communities and held together by a great web of life. Therefore, when people of faith exercise proper stewardship, we are caring for an earth that did not come into being apart from God and a God who called creation into an interdependent relationship. Yeah. There is absolutely nothing unique uniquely Christian about the Genesis myth. Neither is there anything uniquely Christian about the thought that our primary vocation is to care for this big blue marble that we find ourselves on and we share it with all of creation, both aquatic and terrestrial. My friends, there is absolutely nothing uniquely Christian about caring for the place in which we live. People of all faiths make up the scientific community. And these are things that people of all faith who are scientists tell us that we must do as people who occupy the same land. By the mid 21st century, the human population is likely to increase to 9 billion people. If you subtract things like bacteria and ants, and various species of marine life, no other living species will come close to that nine billion member club. None, not one single species. The human footprint is huge. Our land, air, and water are suffering. The planet is groaning. Climate change is real. It is human caused and it's undeniably destructive. But to be clear, but to be clear, this is more than about the beauty of the earth. The beauty of the earth is indeed at stake, but the vast majority of the earth's population is poor. And when the earth groans, I don't know if you have noticed it, but it is the poor who suffer most. According to the World Bank, climate change places 1.3 billion people, poor people, at risk. As the number of hot days increase, precipitation decreases. And with the decrease of precipitation comes drought. And with drought comes crop failure. And with crop failure comes famine. And my sisters and my brothers, famine only has two partners, disease and death. Climate change will affect all of us, yet it is the poor who will suffer the most. My sisters and my brothers, climate change is not a social, political, moral, or religious construct. Climate 
climate change is basic science. Science that my children knew when they were four and five and six years old. It is science that we cannot ignore. It is not something that you have to believe in. It is something that is real. And it is time that people of all faiths come together to talk about what it means to care for the good earth, which we have been given. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you, Rochester. Thank you to the state of New York. Thank you to the Right Reverend Bishop G. Singh, Bishop of the Diocese of Rochester. And I'll try to get off without I'd like to introduce you to an extremely impressive young woman. She's one of a new and growing generation of farmers. Uh, this is Erin Bullock, and she owns her own farm called Wild Hill Farm. Come on up, Erin. Really shout. Okay, I'm a little nervous because it's my first time speaking at a rally, but it's so good. Okay, um, I have a, a, a prepared speech and I'll try not to be too nervous or pee my pants. <laughs> Alright, okay, farming. Um, so I've been farming for like 10 years now and um, this is Elizabeth Henderson. She's been farming for much longer and she's amazing and has set things up well for the next generation. Yay! 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 So, okay, so 200 years ago, three quarters of us were farmers, okay? How many generations? A couple generations ago. Now, less than 2% of us are farmers, okay? We're still eating food, so that food has to come from somewhere. Woo! <laughs> um, so where does the food come from, okay, if we're not growing it ourselves anymore? Pretty much we have outsourced all of our food production to the industrial factory scale agribusiness system, okay? Woo! We've done it. <laughs> Technologies like chemical fertilizers and pesticides, genetic modification, Huge equipment. This has all allowed farmers and agribusiness to produce food quickly and cheaply. So that 98% of us don't have to have careers that involve growing food. Okay, great, right? No. Well, as we're finding out, these systems that we've set up are not so healthy for our bodies, right. our soil, our water, and our planet. I'm not going to tell you anymore, you guys know all about climate change. Yeah, and farm workers. <laughs> it's getting hotter for farm workers out in the field. Um, personally, I also believe that the more our population becomes separated from the grounding act of growing food, the more we risk damaging the fragile biological systems that we rely on. Yeah. I mean, anybody who gardens knows this. Farming and growing food teaches us actual physical connection to nature. It humbles us. We put a seed in the ground. We, we have to hope, we have to trust, we have to wait for the right conditions. And we nurture along and we learn patience. And we learn that we have to wait for things and that sometimes the right conditions like the sun, the rain, the seed, the dirt, what's in the soil, all of these things somehow produce the miracle of food. And then we eat dinner, and we're grateful, and we're exhausted, but we know the process and we're connected, okay? Farmers know that our entire existence depends on the planet, and good organic farmers, they're taking carbon out of the air and putting it back to the soil where it belongs, okay? Yeah. We're actively doing this. We're growing cover crops and uh, various other organic farming techniques. So in the last, in the 10 years that I've been farming, um, I've seen droughts. Last year was a horrible one. I've seen floods and I've seen good young farmers leave farming for other jobs that pay better, okay? Farming is risky. It's hard, it's exhausting. It's getting harder and harder with climate change. If we don't invest our food dollars in small local organic farms, they will not be here for us. 
That's the truth. So we have to think about three times a day we get to vote with our food dollars, okay? We get to put our money in a sustainable future that we want. So if you're not a farmer, like 98% of us, um, find a farmer to support directly. Uh, community supported agriculture is a great way right. to give your food dollars directly to the farmers. Okay. Farmers yeah. are the ones that are taking care of the earth, they're stewarding the organic natural future that we can all imagine if we do not invest our food dollars in local farming in the future that we all want. Um, we'll just build more CAFOs. I mean, the reality is there. And so, <laughs> what kind of future do we want? Do we want to invest in a food system that's healthy for all of us and healthy for our planets? Yeah! yeah. yeah. So join us USA, buy organic, go get free carrots over there at the Wild Health Farm. Food justice! Um, food justice! Thank you. All right, we are going to hear from another impressive young person. His name is Shandon Jones. He's an 11th grader at Virtus High School and Shandon is doing work with Dream Bikes. Come on up Shandon. All right. Okay, you guys can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Not much of a public speaker, so bear with me, guys. Okay, so in 2015, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation accounted for about 27% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. Our methods of transportation matter, so when we choose to walk, bike, or use public transportation, we're making the best choice for our climate. Yes. Yay. Rochester is becoming an increasingly bike and pedestrian friendly city, making this choice easier, but we still have a ways to go. Our organization, Dream Bikes, is teaming up with Rochester's People Climate Coalition, Rochester Youth Climate Leaders, Rochester Cycling Alliance, and Reconnect Rochester to fundamentally transform Rochester into a car culture to a bike truck culture. We are competing for funds that would allow us to provide affordable, high-quality bikes, cycling accessories, and bike safety training for our local youth. We will work with schools, parents, and local government to ensure that we all have opportunities to ride and the safe routes to ride on. So, but we need your help, guys. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a smartphone with you today, which most of us should, please take it out right now and visit T-I-N-U yurl.com slash vote dream bikes to learn more about our project and vote for our video. It only takes a minute and if everybody here votes, we will be on our way to securing the resources we need to make Cycling Rochester preferred methods of transportation. This will in turn improve our health of the planet. Well, if you think about it guys, like going off the paper for a minute, yeah. Everybody, every teenager wants to grow up and get a new car. That's the first thing they want, is the new car. But yeah. I ride to work most of the time. Like, everyone, if, yeah. you, if you get yeah. a bike, it just, it, yeah, it takes so much stress off of your back instead of, okay, paying for gas, oh, all of these parts that break on the car every other week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just ride, ride, walk, yeah. exactly. It does a lot yeah. for our economy. It does a lot for the world, period. So yeah. make sure you encourage your youth to do so, please. Yeah, and okay. <laughs> yeah. Again, the website is tinyurl.com slash vote dream bikes. You can vote once per day from now until May 12th. As a young person whose future depends on the stability of our climate, I appreciate your help with this project. I really do. Thank you so much, Shannon. You really are a great public speaker. Yes. So again, it's tinyurl.com slash votedreambikes. If you put it in your phone now and vote today, it will remember you. And when you go in every day from now until May 12th, you can vote again really easily. We would really love to see this organization win the money to transform Rochester into a more bike and pedestrian friendly city. It's part of doing our part to reduce emissions. 
So last, and you will definitely see not least, we would like to welcome Aaron Michaud. Aaron is the Vice President of the Council of Metro Justice. Welcome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, I'd, I'd like to uh, just leave you with one thought today. And that thought is, if we're going to fight for climate justice, then we need to fight for racial and economic justice. Yes. Indigenous people, black and brown people, and poor people are the front lines of the struggle for a livable planet. They are the people, the, the, the residents of Southwest Detroit, who are fighting against a tar sands oil refinery that was built in their backyard by Marathon Petroleum. They are the tens of thousands of refugees from Western Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East who are fleeing their homelands because of unprecedented drought. And they are the Standing Rock Sioux and their allies who put their bodies on the line to defend their lands and to protect the water supply of millions of Americans. Now the, the wealthy 1%, they have a climate change plan and their plan is to keep doing what they're doing. Every drop of oil that they've discovered, every cubic meter of natural gas is on a balance sheet somewhere. The pipelines that they build today, are they don't even make economic sense unless they're in operation for another 30 or 40 years. Their plan for migrants and refugees is private prisons and detention camps. Their plan is, is permanent warfare. They want to they set nation against nation. They want to set affluent against poor. They want to set white against black and brown so that they can continue to make huge profits. So what's our plan? Our plan is a living wage for all working people. Our plan, as you've heard, is community-controlled renewable energy. Our plan is a truly democratic economy that invests in green jobs, in sustainable housing and mass transit. In short, our plan is sustainable life on this planet. So we have a choice, brothers and sisters. We can either stand together or we can fall apart. Metro Justice has been fighting for racial and economic justice in the Rochester area for over 50 years. We are a proud member of the Rochester People's Climate Coalition, and we stand ready to contribute a rich organizational memory and the unstoppable energy of our members to this struggle. And I just want to make a brief plug, if you haven't seen our flyers, uh, the Liberty Pool on Monday, we are celebrating May Day, International Workers' Day, and immigrants in particular, we will have music, dancing, and poetry. So you're all invited. So I want to leave you with just one question. When our planet is under attack, what do we do? What do we do? When people of color are under attack, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Thank you all. It up. That wraps up our, our slate of speakers. We just want to say thank you all for being here. Also, a reminder that it would be really nice if we could leave this park today better than we found it. So if everybody could find something and pick it up and put it in the garbage, or if it's recyclable, cyclable take it home and recycle it, that would be great. Um, many of you have awesome signs really great signs we hope that you'll take those home yeah yeah what i stand
Rushmore is what I stand on. That's awesome. All of them are great. Use them again. I unfortunately I think we'll need them, but use them again. So clean so clean up the park and I also wanna let you know that next Saturday, there's something every Saturday, is the city's clean sweep program. It's May it's Saturday, May 6th, 8 a.m. Leaves from Frontier Field. Folks will be given breakfast and a t-shirt and sent off in buses to go in groups to clean up different parts of the city. It should be a lot of fun. Um, so thank you to our interpreters, our interpreter liaisons again, to, to RIT students who came and volunteered today, all of our tabling groups. We also want to recognize the approximately 110 people that went down on two buses to Washington, D.C. And everybody who marched in today's rally downtown. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.